me introduce to you Mr. Samuel Blumenfeld. He's the author of six books on education. His writings have earned him a reputation for accurate reporting, objective scholarship, and refreshing candor. He was born and educated in New York City. He studied in France for two years, worked ten years as an editor in the book publishing industry. Mr. Blumenfeld's writings have appeared in a variety of well-known publications. He's a frequent guest on radio and television shows and is in great demand as a speaker. I'm going to ask Mr. Blumenfield to make whatever opening statement he wishes and then take your questions. Mr. Samuel Blumenfeld. Thank you. Thank you for uh, coming. Uh, let me say that uh, the reason why I wrote this uh, book, the NEA Trojan Horse in American Education, is so that conservatives would know what the NEA is up to. The NEA has decided that the conservatives of this country stand in the way of their political and social plans, their programs. And they are out to defeat uh, as many conservatives as they can wherever they are, wherever they run for office. Uh, to show you how serious they are in their intentions, they, uh, they have a program called Combating the New Right a training program developed by the Western States Regional Staff of the National Education Association. And the purpose of that program is to train teachers uh, in how to defeat conservative candidates uh, and uh, to uh, defeat the influences of the so-called new right in this country. And I wrote this book because I, I felt that it was important for conservatives to factor into their plans, into their strategy, the strategy of the uh, NEA. So that's the principal reason why this book was written, and I hope that uh, that conservative candidates will use it in their as they face uh, the NEA in, in the forthcoming elections. Uh, so I will then uh, uh, mainly because uh, while Ronald Reagan won the uh, presidential election very handily, everyone was rather surprised at the lack of, of a coattail effect. And I would attribute the ability to, of the liberals to hold so many seats in Congress and in the legislatures, I would attribute that to mainly the NEA's efforts on the local level, because as you know, they've become very politically active. And uh, so that's the raison d'etre for the book. And, and my reason for coming to uh, Bob Jones University, of course, is to help the students and the people here understand what these issues are. So I will throw it open to to. As, as a uh, former member of the, the NEA, do you feel like local members are, are sort of puppets in the hands of the, the people in the national uh, organization? Or do you think uh, they, too, realize what uh, is going on, as you say, throughout the organization? Now, who's the former member? You are or I am? You. Oh, I, I'm, no, I've never been a member of the NEA. The press release said that you are a former member of the NEA. Well, that's, that's a, an error. Oh. I'm sorry that was in it. No, I've never been a member of the NEA. Uh, as for the teachers in the NEA, believe it or not, 50% of the members of the NEA voted for Ronald Reagan. So obviously they are, don't particularly go along with the... Uh, what their leaders are telling them. Uh, most teachers, I would say, are indifferent to what the NEA stands for. The NEA is run by a small activist minority. And in each uh, school district, they are able to get enough of a group together to work very hard politically. The NEA basically is run by, by its executive committee about nine individuals, and they run this organization that has about 1.7 million members. So it's uh, it, that what they do is they simply, the organization controls the lobbies, they control the, the staffs, uh, they control where the money is spent. Uh, the membership uh, just goes along with it. How is the NAA like the Trojan Horse? The reason why I call the NEA a Trojan horse is, uh, if you remember, 
the National Commission on Excellence in Education issued a very now historic report called The Nation at Risk. And in that report they stated that if the United States, if, if an enemy had done to American education what the United States, what we have done to ourselves, uh, we would well uh, attribute it to, uh, we would well consider it an act of war. And so I felt that, uh, yes, we were doing this to ourselves, and who were the people most responsible for doing it? The NEA. So there's your Trojan horse. There's the so-called enemy. And the, the, the statement is, um, if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. As it stands, we have allowed this to happen to ourselves. So since the NEA has, has played a, a dominant major role in producing this mediocre education system that we have, that they are the Trojan horse within the system. Did you compare public education the way we see it today compared to, say, 10, 20 years ago to let us see the input that the NEA has had on public education? Well, uh, when I went to school, that's more than 20 years ago, in the early 30s, as an elementary uh, school student, you learned to read and write. Everyone learned to read and write. There were much higher academic standards. Uh, today, of course, all of that has changed. We have functional literates by the millions. We have learning, handicapped learning disabled. We have. As a matter of fact, that is now considered the largest group of handicapped children in the United States are those who are so-called learning disabled. And I can tell you right now that these children have been made learning disabled by the schools. You didn't have such, ca such categories didn't even exist when I went to school. No one ever heard of dyslexia back in, the, in those days. Now, why did this happen? It happened because the educators changed the way Americans are taught to read. In the old days, we were taught to read by alphabetic phonics. In the 1930s, they changed the methods. They changed them to what is known as the look-same method, the sight method, the whole word method, whereby they teach children to read English as if it were Chinese. And that is the reason why so many children can't learn to read. At least one-third of the children in American public schools uh, come, uh, become reading failures. At least one-third. And that is an incredible kind of uh, record. And it's all due to the methods. Now, these methods were created by behavioral psychologists. The behavioral psychologists are part of the progressive education program. The progressives took control of the NEA around World War I, and they have used the NEA as their instrument. Now, what is the goal of the progressives? The progressives believe, first of all, they don't believe, they believe that man is an animal. They don't believe, they believe in evolution. They do not believe in man as being created by God. They believe that human beings can be taught as animals. Children can be taught as animals. And they use the techniques developed by Pavlov, Thorndike, Watson, and other behavioral psychologists to teach children. So American children are actually being taught as if they were animals in our schools. The NEA has helped in the, in the sense that they have provided the, the uh, means whereby these behavioral psychologists and the professors can get their methods into the schools. Uh, and they've, of course, uh, helped along with it. For example, in 1955, when Dr. Flesch wrote his famous book, Why Johnny Can't Read, in which he explained that the reason why Johnny wasn't learning to read was because the methods had been changed, the NEA immediately criticized him. They didn't invite him to explain himself in their pages. They, they automatically dismissed him and criticized him and, and uh, chastised him. The NEA has never opened its pages to, uh, to any of the critics of public education. They have simply uh, held, uh, they have simply pushed the line of the progressives, and they do that to this day. 
For example, the NEA has had all sorts of commissions on every possible subject, and yet they have not they have not had a commission on literacy to find out why children aren't learning to read. We know why they're not learning to read, because they're not being taught to read. It's as simple as that. But the NEA isn't interested in getting at the truth. They will tell you, for example, if, they, if you ask them if there's a difference between phonics and look, say, they'll say, well, there are many different ways to teach reading. We don't take a stand on that. Can you imagine the teachers of America not taking a stand on how to teach reading? I mean, if they don't take a stand on that, what do we need them for? Any? Yes. On the state level, we've uh, heard news that a thousand teachers may no longer be able to teach in the state because they didn't score well enough on certification tests. Naturally, local chapters of the NEA are, are crying foul on that. Uh, why do you think uh, a group that basically makes their living off giving tests doesn't feel that tests are, are adequate way of uh, determining their abilities? Well, the, the reason is obvious because uh, many teachers do not really have the uh, capabilities that they should. If the teachers are not illiterate, they are illiterate. You see, most of the young teachers today were taught to read by look say, so they themselves are not terribly literate. And uh, they're not book readers. As a matter of fact, most Americans are not book readers anymore because book reading is difficult. The only, thing, the only books they can read are the, very, the best sellers, which are written down to a fourth grade level, you know, like uh, Robbins and, and Sidney Sheldon. These books are written down for the, for the Dick and Jane level of, of uh, vocabulary. But it's obvious that they don't want the teachers to be tested because so many of their members would be forced out of the profession. It's interesting, though, that they want uh, in Nebraska, for example, they insist that Christian school teachers be tested in non-approved schools. So it's all right to test teachers in non-approved Christian schools, but it's not all right to test public school teachers. You see, the, the rationale is they want to make sure that these children in the non-approved Christian schools have competent teachers, but they don't want to make sure that the children in public schools have competent teachers. To, to make public education better? At this, point, at this point, there's not very much that can be done to make it better because the control of the system is in the hands of the behavioral psychologists. And they are beyond, it's impossible to make them do anything, them, to make them do anything them, than what they are doing. Therefore, that is why I am advising parents to remove their children from the public schools and to put them in private schools, church schools, or to school them at home. Now, there are many parents who are using all three options. As you, as you may know, probably, that homeschooling is now the fastest growing educational development in this country. Because there are a lot of parents who are dissatisfied with the public schools. They don't want their child to become learning disabled. But they can't afford a, one of the high-priced private schools and a Christian school may not be in their area, and so they are turning to homeschooling. But then what about those parents that have to work? Well, they, to they, are, the, they are the ones who are, uh, have a real problem on their hands. I don't know what I could possibly advise them to do except to keep tabs on what they're doing in the schools. The only, the only, uh, the only way that we can possibly counter what is being done in the schools is to follow the advice that... Uh, uh, Phyllis Schlafly is giving in, with these Hatch Amendment letters. I don't know if you're aware of it, but the Eagle Forum has sent out these letters requiring the schools to notify the parents if the child is going to be subjected to some of this uh, psychological testing, death education, sex education, values clarification, the whole so-called humanist uh, uh, curriculum. And uh, the uh, uh, the uh, humanists, particularly the uh, people for the American way, are up in arms over this letter of consent. You see, they, in other words, the, uh, the teachers must get the parents' approval if they're going to teach these subjects to their children. Now, the, uh, the um, people for the American way claim that this is now a form of censorship. 
But I can tell you categorically that if anyone is doing any censoring, it's the humanists, because a very important study has just been completed in, uh, uh, by Dr. Paul Witz of NYU. He's, he studied the social studies textbooks, the reading textbooks, and he, can, and he, can, he proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that all remnants, all mentions of, of God and religion have been removed from American textbooks, particularly uh, references to contemporary religious life in America have been completely removed from the textbooks of America, from the social studies textbooks and the reading textbooks. And this is going to be quite a, this, this report has not even been released yet. I was, I was uh, shown a copy of it in Washington and spoke to Dr. Witz over the phone. And he gave me permission to, to mention that this report had been completed and that it shows that beyond a doubt that if there's any censorship going on in the school books, the humanists are, are, are doing the censoring. So that there is not a trace of Christianity anywhere in American public uh, school books. And we live in a country with, where Christianity is a great reality. All right, so then you're advocating a total withdrawal from the public school system. Yes, uh, because I don't see any, I don't see any how we can reform it. You see, the people in charge are not going to reform it. All they want is money. They keep telling us, give us more money. Now, recently I was in North Carolina, your sister state, and uh, had a, an opportunity to look over that state's master education plan. And I can tell you that it is so bad, I would not subject a dog to it, let alone a child. It's that bad. And yet, that is the kind of thing that's being... Uh, pushed through the state legislatures of this uh, this country. Every state in this in the union has a, a so-called uh, reform plan, a re uh, education reform plan. But all these plans do is get more money to push more humanism. None of them are really going to give us what we want, which is reading, writing, and arithmetic. There isn't a single state that has mandated the teaching of alphabetic phonics in the first grade. Not a single state in areas we try to do that in North Carolina it was impossible to get it through can you imagine that they are mandating globalism they mandate sex education they mandate all kinds of things but you cannot mandate teaching alphabetic phonics in the first grade now if they are serious about solving the reading problem that's the least they can do and until I see that done I see no hope of reform in this system that to me would be the litmus test if they can pass a bill mandating the teaching of intensive phonics in the first grade, to me that would be an indication that reform was possible. But as long as they resist that, then there's no hope for the system. If we don't reform, then how can we educate the American children? What kind of system do you suggest? Well, I, can, I suggest a completely private system. I think that the private sector, as a matter of fact, the private sector is picking up the pieces. The uh, private business now spends I think Time Magazine said it was about $40 billion a year teaching people how to read and write. You know, teaching young people who have just come out of college and going into the business world how to put together a grammatic, uh, uh, grammatical sentence. So obviously money is being spent. In other words, the school system plods along, the public schools plod along and they keep bringing out failures and then the private sector has to pick up the pieces, you see. Uh, business world has to pick up the pieces and pay for it at great expense. Uh, I think it's just going to get worse. Now that you know, they say that there have been a slight improvement in the SAT scores, but we really don't know the factor that's that accounts for this improvement. In the Supreme Court ruling, really, I guess it was in 80, 82, 83, against Bob Jones University, the Supreme Court, I guess, ruled that. Uh, a tax exemption is a subsidy, and that people should not have to <coughs> support a religious school. Should Christians or uh, religious schools have to support public education, as we're currently being made to do so right now? Well, that's an excellent uh, question, and I would say that they should not have to support public education, because public education has now become atheist education, humanist education. And uh, why should Christians uh, support be forced 
to support atheist schools when atheists are not forced to support Christian schools. You see, that, show, that, it, that shows you the injustice of a government school system. You cannot teach without values. The government schools cannot be neutral. They must teach values. Now, whose values are they going to teach? If they're not going to teach the values of, of our Christ, uh, Judeo-Christian traditions, they're going to teach somebody else's values. And whose values are they teaching? They're teaching the values of the humanists. Now, John Dewey created humanism as a religion to replace Christianity, as a religion to replace our traditional religions. He considered it a religion. The humanists consider it as, as a substitute for religion. So why should Christians be forced to pay for that? You think so will pursue litigation? I hope they will. I hope they do, we'll have, a, we'll have a chance knowing the, the thinking of the court systems today. Well, uh, you know, even if they lose, say, the case once, you have to keep going back. Persistence. The courts once ruled that, that uh, blacks were not humans back in the, the Dred Scott Clay case, you know. Now the courts rule that un the unborn are not human. Ten years from now, they may decide that they are human. So we just don't know. You know, the, the, court, the court seems to uh, reflect popular opinion, popular philosophy. They are as susceptible. You know, they are not those Olympian judges sitting up there with absolute truth. They are very human. So we've got to keep pursuing this, but I think the I think the uh, the issue of fairness is very important as to why should Christians be forced to pay for atheist education, and why should atheists get a free ride? Why should only atheists be eligible for public funding? They're the only ones who can uh, have a say in the public schools. No other religion can. So why don't we make the atheists put them on an equal? level with everyone else. Let them pay for their schools. Let everyone pay for their own schools, and then everyone will be happy. When President Reagan commented on the improved SAT scores, he said that he wanted to raise the annual percentage 7% until 1990. What, what do you think that the, what kind of measures are the uh, NEA taking to implement that? Well, I don't think the NEA is doing very much about academics anyway. Uh, the reason why you have a the increase in the scores may be, I have not spoken to the people at ETS. I, I intend to speak to them to, to find out, first of all, have they changed the tests? Have the tests been made easier? Second, you want to find out, are they also uh, figuring in their scores the tests of private school students? because uh, there is an increase in private school enrollment. And if you're factoring in a higher level of uh, academic achievement from the private schools and mixing them with the public schools, maybe the public schools are getting credit for something that they're not responsible for. We don't know yet. And uh, uh, so those, those two are very important points, whether the tests have been made easy, because there have been complaints that the tests were, were uh, biased against minorities, culturally biased. Now, have they, uh, did they change any of those tests? We don't know. Also, there is now there are many preparation courses for SATs. Uh, people take special courses to prepare for SATs. Um, they get copies of old SAT uh, tests and they uh, study them. So between all those those three factors, one would have to find out if they are significant in the increase of the scores, whether it's the preparation for the tests, changing of the tests, and including private schools among the testees. What I hear you saying, Americans are not being taught as if they're animals. Like yes. You see, the behavioral psychologists believe that we're all animals. You know, we're the products of evolution. All of their experimentation has been with animals, that is, in training techniques, Pavlov with the Pavlovian, with the Pavlov dogs, uh, Skinner with the rats, Thorndike with chickens, and they have, they believe that they can use these very same techniques on human beings. And those are the techniques which are being used in teaching children in America. 
And if you will notice that in, in, in your curriculum, the, they will always talk about behavioral objectives. In other words, they are only interested in behavior modification, behavioral objectives in their courses. You see, the, the uh, behaviorists do not believe that, first of all, that man has a soul, so they eliminate anything of any spiritual significance in the curriculum. If he has no soul, why feed it, you know? And uh, why nourish it? And if his mind is simply a manifestation of behaviorism, because they believe that speech, for example, is, they call it verbal behavior, uh, then uh, why bother about developing the mind? Intellect. They don't believe in such a, a notion as intellect. And that's why so many young people today do not use their minds, cannot use their minds. They have not been trained to use their minds. They don't even know that there is something up there that can be used. And that's why I say they've been trained as animals. And the result is that the children act like animals. Many schools are called zoos. I don't know how, you know, I've, I've been told by youngsters who tell, me, who tell me about that zoo they go to. And it's because the kids are hanging from the rafters and swinging back and forth, you know, figuratively. Sometimes literally, but... <laughs> But that's what's going on in American education today. The children act like animals. They're told, if it feels good, do it. They are given barnyard, uh, barnyard ethics, jungle ethics, barnyard ethics. And that's why the kids today, they, uh, with their lack of spiritual nourishment, they hunger for something. So they go to the rock concerts. And who do they worship? people up there on the stage. They go berserk. They go bananas over that. And uh, you can see it. It's, we've, we've, we've turned these kids into pagans. Incidentally, religion has not been completely eliminated from American schools. They are now putting in Eastern religion. You're getting meditation, yoga, and different forms of, of uh, pagan practices are being used in the public schools. Uh, I know in, in some uh, first grade classrooms they have the children lie down on the floor and have out of body experience so that they can pantheistically associate themselves with all of all of the universe you know they project themselves out of their bodies body projection and that's very closely tied in with Hindu practices Eastern practices last night you mentioned death education how widespread is that Death education now is in virtually every school district. They're concentrating basically in the junior high school with death education. Death education to me is one of the most dangerous, unhealthy, and lunatic developments in American education. It, it, uh, it borders on the psychotic, really. Now what they do is they, they dwell on death. They tell children, about, they they take children to cemeteries, to funeral parlors. Uh, they have children um, watch undertakers embalm bodies. They have kids try out coffins. Uh, they write, they, they even build model coffins. They write their own obituaries. They write suicide notes. They discuss suicide at great length on how to do it, when to do it, uh, the ways to do it, and uh, why they might do it. And as a result, we now have had, in the last year, 6,000 teenage suicides. We never had an epidemic of teenage suicide before. No one has connected the two. No one has said, well, listen, if we have all of this, this, this uh, preoccupation with death and suicide, is this not a cause, perhaps, of suicide? But none of the public schools have addressed that problem. All they do is they throw up their hands and then they invite some psychologists in to then gather everyone in the auditorium and to discuss suicide even more. It's the same thing with sex education. They say, well, gee, now that we have all of these teenagers who are getting uh, pregnant, what's the cure for it? Well, let's start sex education earlier. Have more of it. But we find out that that doesn't create uh, more awareness. It just creates more sexual activity. 
So, I, I, and I hold the educators responsible for this increase in suicide. I want to see an investigation of death education as a cause. I want to see some investigation. I don't see why the Department of Education doesn't spend some of the taxpayers' money in trying to find out if there's an, a, a cause and effect there between the teaching of sex education and suicides. And you could very easily do it by simply going into the schools where they've had a high rate of suicide, as in some schools in the Dallas area and the Houston area and in Chattanooga, and simply seeing if they've had these courses in those classes, if these youngsters have been exposed to this kind of teaching. That would be the simplest thing to do. That was fast. Well, there one more question. Uh, yes. Do you comment on the claim of this value-neutral education? I think you've been touching on it right here, but that is the claim by the public educators that everything is neutral, no values are taught. Would you comment on that? Well, they claim that, it, that, uh, education, that public education is uh, yeah. neutral. But I don't think they believe it. Uh, I think they really know that there are values taught. You cannot have education without values. That's why they teach values clarification. They know that children must be taught values. But whose values are they going to be taught? Well, they're going to teach their, they are now teaching them the values of the humanists, which, uh, which hold that there are no absolutes the Ten Commandments are invalid, that they're old-fashioned, and they teach what is known as situational ethics. That your ethics have to fit the situation. For example, there is no absolute against stealing. In other words, there may be, there may be instances when stealing is okay. There is no absolute against murder. There may be instances when murder is okay. Uh, and they will usually use the lifeboat situation. In other words, they'll go to an extreme situation but what that seems to do is give the youngsters an excuse to steal or, or commit crime uh, in, uh, in a much less extreme situation. For example, why do we have this incredible epidemic of shoplifting, especially among young people, especially among affluent kids? Because they no longer have a sense that there's anything wrong in stealing. Thou shalt not steal. Well, there is no God. There is no sin. We're not going to be punished. And anyway, you know, somebody else stole it. So they're only stealing it back or some kind of nonsense like that. Well, we know that public education will probably going to be around for years and years and years to come. If the values that you're talking about are being taught in our schools, what do you foresee, uh, foresee happening to society, say, 10, 20 years down the road? What, what are we going to have here? Well, we're going to have more of what we have unless there is a, a tremendous uh, revival. If there is a sufficiently strong Christian revival, what you will have, it, you'll, what we now have is a dual society. We have two cultures living in one country. You have a Christian culture, which adheres to the basic traditional values, the absolutes, and then you have this relative humanist culture. The humanists are now dominant. The Christians are gaining an influence. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what the outcome of this struggle is going to be between these two forces in this country. Uh, and, uh, but much hinges on who controls the public schools. I don't see any way whereby Christians will ever control the public schools. They shouldn't even want to control them. They should want to get their children out of them and put them in Christian schools. So it's up to uh, it's up to basically parents of America, and I don't know what they're going to do. Things may get a lot worse before they get any better. What is what is your fear about the outcome if, if nothing changes? Well, the fear of the outcome is that we will have a nation that wallows in in uh, in immorality even more than we have now. I mean, the trend is to, for example, in rock rock music, to get more extreme. But then, of course, you have all kinds of th strange things happening in us, like AIDS. All of a sudden, you have an epidemic, like a plague comes upon us. And now everybody's talking about AIDS. What is stopping the sexual revolution? It's not Christianity. It's not the Christian revival. It's herpes, AIDS. And about a, a half dozen or a dozen other sexually transmitted diseases, that's stopping the revolution. These people are going to have to rethink their lifestyles. 
God works in strange and wonderful ways. Yes, well, thank you very much.